Good afternoon uh, and welcome to the fourth and final session of the Fitland Exchange Series, hosted in the World's Soil Museum, Wageningen. Now, the Pitland Exchange Series, for those of us attending for the first time, uh, comprises of research talks for the wider community on pitland related topics. It is organized in collaboration between the Israel World Soil Museum, uh, Home Turf Project, and Wet Futures. Oh, sorry. I need to move. Yeah, sorry about that. So, yeah, I was saying uh, it's in collaboration with uh, uh, Israel World Soil Museum, the Home Turf Project and Wet Futures, the Drenz Museum too. Now, the World Soil Museum collaborates with artists on the broader topic of soil to create uh, more awareness, facilitate dialogue, learning and exchange, and to stimulate engagement and curiosity, wonder, exploration, and enjoyment. So we hope that you will enjoy this again today. Now, this year we have an artist in residence, Kate. Uh, uh, her residence includes, amongst others, the Pit Exchange Series, an exhibit in the World Soil Museum, and other engagement and dialogue uh, events. <clears throat> Now, we are pleased to have Kate with us on this fourth uh, series of the Pitland Exchange. Now, presently, there are a number of exhibits in the museum relating to the Pitland series, courtesy of Kate's residency. Now, the first three series, as you can see, uh, they are all available on YouTube. The one of today will also be uh, available on YouTube. Now, today's series, the fourth one, will explore current perception of peatlands in the Netherlands and in Ireland to look at uh, the relation of such perception to uh, research and how an artist can characterize non-human figures uh, for new narratives. So that last part Kate will be doing this afternoon. Now, to contribute to this, I've mentioned Kate, we have Maria DeWitt, uh, a research and education officer in cultural geography at uh, Wageningen University in Research. And then we have Emily Toner. Emily is National Geographic Explorer and Israel Community Manager. And we have Kate herself, our artist in residence, who is an environmental artist and Walls uh, Soil Museum artist in residence. We're really pleased to have you with us, uh, Kate, and looking forward to what you have to offer again this afternoon. And then we have Roy from Bake, who is also, uh, who gives us the pleasure of his presence today. Now, I am Mary Stavering Mosugu. I work at ISRIC as a project coordinator and have the pleasure of moderating this afternoon uh, in, on behalf of Stephen Mantle. Stephen is the head of the World Soil Museum. Unfortunately, today he's on an external mission outside the Netherlands. So I have the pleasure of falling in for Stefan. Okay. Sorry for taking us too fast. I promised myself I would do a good job, but uh, let's see how that goes. Now, the title of today's uh, series is uh, living with peatlands today. Now, normally, Stefan would show you uh, an object from the museum uh, with information that links to today's topic. We are operating outside the museum today, but we'll do our best to, you know, keep the tradition. So I would like to show us, instead of a monolith from uh, the museum, a picture of a monolith from the museum collection. On the left-hand side, we have a pit profile, a pen, uh, firm pit with clay topsoil. And I just put on the right side uh, a cross section of a part of where I live, Hauda, a well known uh, peatland area. <laughs> now, Hauda, we're talking about living with peatlands today. 
how that I mean, I think it couldn't have been a better topic for me to participate in. Uh, how that is well known for uh, subsidence. Our ground uh, surface is always subsiding, and we are always busy trying to raise the uh, the ground level in Howda. And this subsidence has a lot of consequences. We see structures like this with cracks, damages, cracks on roads. Uh, and also we have cases of uh, flooding because the groundwater level comes even closer to the surface with the subsiding uh, ground. So we are always busy trying to live with our peatland in, uh, in Howda. This costs a lot of uh, time, uh, money, uh, it affects our politics, it affects a lot of things, our culture, our way of life. It determines what we do at different times of the year. That is how that. So, I mean, you could read a lot about this and uh, uh, a lot of information is available about this on how that, the peatland area. Uh, so, yeah. I think to save time, I'll just use this uh, last slide to show us, you know, the, if you look at the cross section, I mean, the profile I showed, we see uh, the, uh, a pitland that is overlain by a clay layer. That is the same in Howder. We have this, do you have the pointer? No, okay. Now the red bits are the clay that overlay uh, the pit, and under that you have sand. So in Howda, we have a lot of monuments that are built on the clay. That is the stable part of uh, of the of the land, and all around there, the, the ground uh, subsides. It sinks because of the pit that gets that degenerates, and then the ground gets lowered. So this uh, happens also in. Uh, in residential areas, like I mentioned earlier. And then a lot is being done to ensure that people still can, you know, live comfortably, live their normal lives. And what for us in Howder now normal is, if you listen to all of this, is adapting to our clay, I mean, sorry, our pit environment. Now, uh, like I said, there's a lot to be said about this, but I will not take much more of our time and uh, would like to hand us over to Maria, who will have specific uh, expert information to give to us today. But before, sorry, before doing that, I think I need to, I want to tell you about the program of the day. Oh, sorry. sorry, just a minute. I think I was too... Yeah, just a bit of, yeah. Uh, after this uh, introduction, uh, Maria will present, just as said, and then we will have five minutes uh, break. And her presentation after the break will be followed by two presentations from Emily and from Kate. And each presentation will be followed by a session of question and answers. You could pause to ask your question, you know, or you could also put the questions in the uh, chat and we'll ensure that we answer as many of these as possible. And then we'll round up with a group discussion. Thank you, enjoy. All right, thank you all. Um, thank you, Mary, as well, for this lovely introduction uh, of today's um, peatland exchanges. So like she said, um, I'm Maria de Witt, um, and I work for the um, Agni University um, as an education and research officer. Uh, and I got involved in a Wet Futures project a bit more than a year ago. Um, and I was asked to, to do this re research on, on uh, perceptions of Dutch raised bogs. Um, and uh, yeah, due to, to and do this together with uh, Roy van Beek, who has also been mentioned, and uh, uh, Maurice Paulus and Floor Huisman. So actually a couple of people that we've seen in the last couple of sessions. So I'll, I'll talk about that. 
um, about these perceptions. Uh, perhaps you've seen the last session already um, uh, in which Abby Flint already said something about um, how uh, bogs, uh, peatlands overall, were uh, perceived in England. Um, but I'll, I'll focus on, on the Dutch um, perceptions and actually also compare them on um, compare them to the past. So, so how it has developed over time. Um, so, uh, yeah, please feel free to uh, mention anything in the chat, um, any questions or, or whatever you prefer to share. Um, so, first off, if it works, it might not. Ah, perfect. Um, so before I start uh, talking about how other people perceive race bogs, uh, I'd love to uh, give you a brief moment for yourself to think like, oh, but how, how do I perceive bogs? Have I ever been to a bog? And what was my first uh, impression of such a place and what emotions uh, came up? And just just a, a brief moment to think. And perhaps if, if you feel free um, I feel free to share some first words that come into mind. Um, this was my first time in a bog, and you see, as you can see, um, it was pretty wet, um, but it, this is part of the experience, right? Um, so what has been said about the perception of race bogs? Well, um, it used to actually have a very negative stereo, it was negatively stereotyped, so um, but we wanted to make sure or, or <laughs> find out whether this uh, stereotype was actually true, um, because it is fairly peculiar that it has such a neg negatively um, stereotype, because it has a great economic and great cultural use also in the past and still. Um, so, well, actually now um, in the present, uh, it is an important provider of uh, ecosystem services, so it is actually seen as a threatened landscape, the race bog, um, and it uh, it has uh, great purposes. So it stores carbon and uh, water, does a lot of water regulation, uh, biodiversity, and obviously preserves a, a great um, amount of cultural history. So. Um, as you can imagine, this is actually very complex management that, um, well, because there are so many uh, different interests at stake. Um, so uh, we, we thought it would be very relevant uh, to actually find out what the common people, let's say, uh, actually think of race box in the Netherlands. So how do just people like you and me um, perceive these places? So in our study, we focused on eight place meanings. Uh, Maurice Paulus already mentioned a couple of these. And as you can see in this image, um, we focus on, well, fairly different areas within uh, the Netherlands. So we focus on five meanings that were already um, pinpointed by Jacobs and Baus in 2011, uh, which include uh, biodiversity, beauty, attachment, functionality, and risk. So, um, yeah, this was already done in a qualitative study. They, uh, Jacobs and Baus, they, um, they sort of discovered um, how people ascribe meanings and they sort of came down to these five place meanings uh, that all of them, they could sort of uh, focus on these five. Um, as an addition to these five, um, we added admiration, historicity and mystery as uh, three added place meanings. Um, and in this study, we combined several disciplines. Um, we uh, combined archaeological sources, uh, which focused on um, area A and B, as well as the historical analysis also focused on uh, A, which is the Boertanger Moor, and B is the Bale. Um, and then eventually we uh, did a present day survey, uh, which you could see actually in these uh, is one till six, but I'll talk about that later. Um, all right, so to take you briefly through some results, uh, here you can see an image by, um, well, a photograph that was taken by Landwehr in 1892. And it is a, an image of, of uh, a trackway that led into the bog. So it was actually a very big path that led right, right into the Boertanger Moor. And this archaeological find already indicates a couple of place meanings that we saw throughout time. 
Um, and it sort of it shows a desire to enter this landscape, right? Um, so it shows the the place meaning functionality because there's a reason why you want to go into uh, such a place. At the same time, it also shows some inconvenience or risk because, um, well, <laughs> you you you're building a a road, so there was um, you couldn't enter it just just by foot. Um, or uh, at least not easily. So there's also this perception of risk to some extent to enter the bog uh, in that time. Um, just, to, just to clarify this, the fact that it was found in 1892 um, doesn't mean that it is actually from that time, it's actually from uh, way before. Um, and finally, we also found in the archeological sources that there's a, a sense of mystery to the bog because um, for example, this trackway as well, it it's it didn't even cross the bog. It didn't cross, um, or it didn't go from one end to the end, uh, other end, but actually stopped right in the middle. Um, and this indicates some sort of mystery. And it was actually, um, people will say, or researchers say that it actually indicated that it was uh, for ritual purposes that it ended up in the bog. So um, in the archeological sources, um, you could see that uh, there are several uh, finds obviously used in this research, but they include the place meanings, functionality, risk, and mystery, mainly. Um, so they're also, in this study, we included a lot of votive deposits, and this also, once again, um, indicates some sort of mystery. And we saw in, in the presentation of, of Roy van Beek and Floor Huisman that um, these are actually, uh, there were very valuable items that were left in the bog. And uh, this shows that it has a, a great ritual purpose. Um, so secondly, um, yeah, so Maurice uh, Paulusse, he also uh, covered uh, this bit uh, in the last session, but I'll, I'll, I'll quickly mention uh, what he said if you haven't seen it. Um, so as you can see in this graph as well, um, in the, the green bits, let's say, the um, uh, historical sh um, sources also show that functionality and risk were perceived already in the Middle Ages, but also in the early mo modern period. And this was probably because um, in these sources, it was actually referred a lot to the economic use of these bogs. So not just, um, um, or mainly about peat cutting actually. So it has a, had, a, had a great function back then. Um, similarly, the risk um, was found in these sources, in these historical sources, because well, people were afraid that perhaps their cattle might drown. These kinds of things popped up in this historical analysis. And, and throughout time, especially in the late modern period, these other, um, the, the other place meanings were also, um, they popped up, let's say. Um, and that was mainly because more peat got cut away. We've heard a lot about this peat cutting in, in the other sessions. But uh, so more got cut away and, and people got a sense of a, a loss, actually, a loss of beauty, a loss of biodiversity, because uh, their, their um, landscape was changing. So eventually, um, and we did a present day survey on how it is perceived today. Um, well, you could imagine, I don't know whether you've been in a bog, race bog, especially in the Netherlands recently, but it has changed quite a lot. And um, there are paths now, there are uh, cycling lanes, there's a watchtower, there are benches, there are signs, and they sort of make sure that you won't get lost. So there are protected nature reserves with very different purposes. They have leisure purposes now. Um, so it is very likely that these place meetings that I've just told you about might have changed great time um, compared to, to now. So um, what we did for this study is targeted, targeted uh, six different study sites. This includes uh, Vochtelauervein and Bargervein, which is one and two, uh, Korenburgvein and Wolzevein, uh, three and four, and eventually five and six are the Maria Dornesveel and uh, the Grote Peel. So um, yeah, we, we measured these, these um, place meetings that I, I mentioned before uh, using three different items. And eventually we got 
um, 821 respondents. And to, to indicate how we measured those place meetings is actually, uh, we measured them with statements and they could agree from minus two to um, completely disagree uh, or the other way around. So from minus two, completely disagree to plus two, uh, completely agree. Um, so before I get into those place meetings, um, first I want to show you some other uh, brief results. Uh, so this is about the activities that people currently perform in the Dutch box that we've um, studied. Um, so you can see is not surprisingly, uh, there are mainly leisure activities so that people go cycling and walking and plant watching or bird watching and taking photographs of all kinds of things in these uh, areas. And this is actually um, important how they or what they do is, is because what they do also contributes to how they perceive. For example, if you do voluntary work, for example, um, you're very probably very attached to the place because you know a lot about it and you tell other people uh, stories about the place. So it does actually matter what you do in a place on, and it has an effect on how uh, you perceive a place. Uh, what could be said about these figures is that Cycling, for example, is, um, well, the, the, the percentage of people that go cycling in, for example, Bargeveen or Vogteloveen is fairly higher. Um, but this is probably because of um, infrastructural reasons. So there's actually quite a good infrastructure for cycling in these two areas. Um, right. So um, finally, let's talk about place meetings. Um, so what you could see, uh, the first thing you could see when looking at this graph is that they're actually all positive um, scores. So that means that there are all these place meetings that are agreed to, to some extent. Um, so they're all positive. Um, and, and see that they actually ascribe these meanings. Um, so obviously, uh, biodiversity and beauty are the, the two um, largest place meanings or the most uh, dominant place meanings that were found these days. Um, and um, yeah, so, so it goes down actually, um, for example, risk is only just a little bit. Um, so what you could also see in this graph is that the volts of vein, which is the light blue, um, uh, the light blue in the graph, is that it's a little lower for each of these scores for each of these place meanings. And um, what we think actually is that um, the World Vein was closed when we measured this uh, or, or just a year ago uh, due to COVID, uh, COVID measure or measures in this bog. So there was perhaps a different perceptions, a perception of this bog. Right, so what is actually very interesting when you compare these perceived um, place meanings to what we've discussed about the past is actually that risk and functionality and mystery that were most dominant or mostly found in the findings of archaeological uh, uh, or the archaeological findings and as well as in the historical analysis is that they actually score lowest um, in the results we have of today. So that seems to be a bit of a contradiction. And um, that, so uh, the reason for this might be because the physical landscape itself um, changed quite a lot um, because, uh, well, obviously, like I said, it has leisure purposes now. So there is barely any risk perceived because, well, you can barely get lost <laughs> to, to, to start with. Um, so, and also the mystery people don't, um, deposit uh, certain objects in these boxes uh, anymore because um, yeah, you're not allowed to. Um, and, and so there are different um, perceptions of, of these places uh, these days. Um, so finally, if, if conservation is actually to succeed, we will have to take into account these place meetings. Um, we'll have to take, account, take into account to how the common people um, actually uh, uh, perceive a place. So, um, yeah, and, and, and how, 
um, this, this this perception of these common people, just the people like you and me, would actually give insights in how management decisions will be perceived and perhaps where where conflicts may arise as well. Um, so that was it for me for for today. Um, yeah, I'd like to open up the floor. Um, I've seen that's already being done, so that's great. Um, for any questions, um, once again, like I said in, in, in the first few slides, please share some experiences that you've had in the bog. I'm very curious what, what you experience, experience when you're there. And well, uh, I'd love to hear all about it. And thank you, Emily, for <laughs> organizing all this. Yeah. You ask there. Yeah. Thanks very much, Kate, for this uh, informative uh, presentation. Uh, I see there's a lot of uh, response right from when you started. First, starting with Kate, who hears a screech when she sees uh, the, the slide with uh, the shoes in the book, and that uh, resonates with me. Uh, we have uh, a number of uh, uh, questions, uh, or sorry, comments in the chat. But before I go to them, I would like to ask if there's anyone that would like to uh, ask a question. I think we're good. Or right. Okay. Uh, now I think I have. Uh, I would just like to. Uh, I made a few comments about what uh, Maria uh, said. Uh, <clears throat> I. Uh, you know, you mentioned that uh, there are various stereotypes and I was wondering about race box. Uh, I was wondering uh, which of these uh, stereotypes show a good understanding of what these land types are. Is there any particular one that you can say, yes, it's based on a good understanding of race box? I'm not sure about a good understanding, but uh, I can elaborate a little bit about that. So uh, it used to be, um, people used to say that it was bleak or boring and very wet. So obviously it is still very wet even now. So that is based on on, on uh, right um, on, on facts to some extent, but uh, it was also said it was dangerous. So it was all these negative words. Um, that were part of the stereotype and semi based on what's real and what's not real. Um, but so, so that, that, that was what it used to be. And perhaps it was dangerous back then um, because there were no paths and there were no signs, there were no lights or whatever. Um, but for, for now, now they're nature reserves and now they're closed at nighttime. It's not as dangerous or as risky anymore, uh, but it is still wet. Yes. So some things are actually uh, still relevant. Yes. OK. Now, thanks very much uh, uh, for that. Uh, is there anyone who would any uh, like to interject with a question at this point? Uh, otherwise, I, uh, I was I also- see Emily. Sorry, Mary. I see Emily oh. raising a hand here. Okay, sorry, <laughs> sorry, Emily. Thanks. Um, I just I was really intrigued by the idea that the mystery is gone from the bog somehow. I mean, it's not gone necessarily, but it was more mysterious in the past, perhaps, and now it's less so. And you were explaining, you know, there's more infrastructure, there's less danger. But I just wonder if you feel something is lost in a way, or you know, maybe as our spaces are less wild, there's less mystery. I don't know. I just wondered if you had any reflections about that. That is very true. I think the mystery is still there to some extent. And it, it is a great question. Thank you for that. But um, yeah, yeah, I think the mystery is still there, but perhaps it's less perceived and it's less related to, um, well, gods that used to be well, it used to be the place of, of, of where, where you uh, deposit things for, for gods, right? So um, perhaps it has lost that meaning, but the well, if I share my own experience, if you're still in this place, it's still a bit spooky because it's, I don't know, there's there's water everywhere and there's all these sounds of, 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 of all the vegetation there and, and 
like it still has a mysterious feel to it. Um, but the results show at least that uh, that is less perceived by the people um, uh, yeah, that, that filled out the, the survey. Hmm. But there's also a remark by, uh, by Jelle Moray in the chat. Yeah. I hear an echo here, by the way, which is slightly annoying, but I'll, I'll try and ignore that. But um, you mentioned indeed that the uh, mysterious definition is a bit problematic, maybe. And, and maybe it's something that we, uh, as modern day archaeologists, would uh, try to refrain from. But it's something indeed that we struggled with. So how do you call that that um, a specific aspect of, of mystery? And in archaeology, it's often called a, a mythical dimension, something like that. So th that has a slightly different tone than uh, than mystery. Uh, but what really came out of the analysis of also of historical sources is that um, there's not one simple black and white distinction between mysterious or economic or um, uh, worldly or uh, or take or something like that. So a, a book could have different meanings at different times, uh, but also at the same time, or, or maybe a different meaning in in, in the nighttime than in the daytime. So it, it was far more complex and nuanced than just having black and white distinctions of something for the gods or something for economic use. And uh, I think that's something that also came out of the research of uh, of Maurice Paulusen, which he's about to submit next week. <laughs> so. Yeah, it's definitely not to. exclusive from each other. People perceive all kinds of things. And also what has been shown in this presentation is just, um, yeah, it, uh, like the, the results of these days, they're just averages of, of the outcome, but that doesn't mean that everyone thinks that there's no mystery. Uh, it just means that this is the average of, of what came out of the of, of the survey. So that is actually a good disclaimer. Um, and indeed, there's way more nuance uh, in, in these results. Uh, some people perceive all of them a lot, and some people don't perceive any of them. Um, so indeed, there's there's quite some nuance, yes. Were there more comments in the chat, Mary, or? Tell me she's muted. Oh, Mary, you're muted. That, yeah, I was just going to say uh, that in the chat, Yela also, uh, in addition, uh, finds it a very interesting and uh, relevant uh, presentation, all the same. And uh, there's from Kate, Kate says she had to learn from scratch that there are different sorts of pitlands race bogs and coastal lowlands in the Netherlands. And she wonders if it is important that the areas are mainly nature reserves. And uh, uh, it seems people go there for leisure and wonders if people in, in Gouda would have different things to say about pitlands. It seems they are becoming dangerous in new ways. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Kate, for that. Uh, do you want to say something first, uh, Maria, before? I say well, I, uh, just uh, just a small comment. I do think that race bogs and and fenlands or um, uh, other bogs are 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 different from each other. But I think there must be some uh, similarities in at least physical uh, dimensions, right? So it might be perceived um, a little similar, familiar, similar uh, but it might. Um, I do wanted the same whether in Gouda what the perception is there. So please elaborate, Mary. <laughs> yeah, the perceptions are different. If I look at it from my own point of view, I think you mentioned something about uh, people perceive some people perceive it as uh, a risk, and some people as something of uh, 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 that has a function. I think we have both in Gouda and also our neighboring uh, settlements, they are Reivik. I think you see the function that uh, the uh, uh, cut out pit areas now have, recreational purposes and all of that. But I think if you live in the center of Kauda where you have uh, shops and buildings that are often flooded, you could see it, uh, your perception would be different. That is talking about the, uh, uh, the current uh, views. Yeah, it's also interesting in these results to see how risk has changed in its perception overall, because it used to be um, uh, a risk that was perceived as if um, uh, you could drown and drown in such a uh, in such an area. Well, now it is actually a risk on 
uh, whether it might disappear, whether so it's a, it is a different interpretation indeed of how risk is perceived now. So yeah, there there is even even now in in just the concept risk, it is it is very different from what it was uh, in history. Yeah, I think one of the main differences is, is between the areas that you measured is that they indeed are nature reserves, which are protected on their not two to thousand uh, regulations and stuff, and people go there for their um, generally for their environmental qualities. Whereas the other um, uh, defendants, the reclaimed areas of powder and environment, they are indeed man-made landscapes. They're completely organized and structured by men since already a thousand years or so. So the, they will have a completely different feel to them anyway, also for the people living them. Yes, you're, you're muted again, Mary. <laughs> Sorry, thanks very much. Uh, you want to say something about that before we go on break? On the comment from uh, Roy, thanks for the comment. Uh, <clears throat> yeah? Um, I, I, I agree. <laughs> okay. I'd leave it to that, yeah. All right. Now, thanks uh, very much. I think we can take a break now for five minutes. Oh, even, uh, yeah. And then when we come back, we take the presentation uh, from uh, Emily's presentation. Uh, for now, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Maria for a very informative presentation and for the contribution from uh, participants uh, online, uh, from Roy, Kate, uh, all of us. Thanks very much, uh, Maria. No worries. <laughs> Welcome back, everyone. Uh, we will continue uh, with the the presentation on uh, Pitland Perceptions, Voices from Irish Books by Emily. I introduced you before Emily, so we'll skip that, I think. <laughs> so thank you, Mary, and uh, hello, everyone. My name is Emily Toner, and as was said before, I work here at ISRIC World Soil Information with the home of the World Soil Museum, who's hosting this series. But today I'm presenting to you um, in my capacity as a National Geographic Explorer. And I'll tell you a little bit more about what that means. And um, we're going to go from the Netherlands, which has really been the focus of a lot of the presentations and peatland exchanges so far, uh, to Ireland, a place also with a lot of peatlands and look at uh, the perceptions of people there of the peatlands around their country. So, um, the National Geographic connection here is that in 2018 and 2019, I did a fellowship that was called the Fulbright National Geographic Digital Storytelling Fellowship, and it's supported through National Geographic Society, which is a nonprofit arm of National Geographic that um, provides grants to people doing projects aligned with conservation topics or uh, even cultural research of many different things, and it's also through the Fulbright program which is a US State Department funded academic exchange program. So through this fellowship, uh, the people that were awarded it had pitched stories of significance to both of those programs. And my story that I pitched, I will tell you uh, more about in a moment, but just to say that, yeah, we all got to go abroad for a year. And so I was in Ireland for a year uh, looking for stories that I could tell through digital methods. And so the background of the application and, and the story that I was pursuing in Ireland is that I have a background in soil science and um, I have a degree in agronomy from Iowa State University and then also a master's in geography from the University of Wisconsin-Madison that came from a biogeochemistry lab there. And so when I look at soils, I really see them through the lens of US soil taxonomy, which is a uh, system of classifying soils that has at its base 12 soil orders. And in the world of peatlands, they, they all fit into the order histosol, which is the organic soil. And to be a histosol, you have to have 10% uh, or more organic matter. And so peat soil is far and above that in a lot of cases, can be 50 or even 90% organic matter. So they're really fascinating soils. And here you can see one in Ireland, really, really dark uh, because of the organic content. And the organic content is, can be very deep. So the normal soil that I grew up with in Iowa in the United States is a rich mollusol. It's another very um, 
yeah, a soil that would have seemed to have a lot of organic matter, but just to give you context, it's usually in the top foot or two, and it's usually 5% or less. So here you can see an organic soil in a peatland that has a few meters deep of super high. This is probably 90 plus percent organic matter in this peatland. So the reason that National Geographic thought, okay, let's send her to Ireland to interview people and talk about their perception of peatlands was in part because of this graph that I showed them. And when you think about peatlands, you know, in the contemporary context, a lot of us think if you know peatlands and you know uh, soil carbon at all, you're thinking about climate change and global car carbon storage. And, um, you know, if you ask the average person who's not involved in peatlands, where is carbon stored around the world? organic carbon, I should say, you might get uh, the answer in trees or in rainforests is often, you know, an answer people think those are really rich vegetative spaces. And forests do have a lot of carbon. So you can see on this graph, it's just showing a global um, total of carbon and gigatons held in these different uh, types of ecosystems and then categories. So forests hold a lot of uh, carbon, almost half of all the carbon stored in all vegetation, but soil holds a whole lot more carbon than plants. And if you look at peat soil, it is uh, covering only 3% of our land mass, but has as much organic carbon as all plants all over the globe. So, and it has about double of all forests. So when you're thinking about climate change and in the contemporary importance of landscape management for climate change, then it becomes very important to think about how we manage the carbon that is in peat soil and in peatlands. So that was the basis of the story that I told National Geographic that I wanted to help tell in Ireland. And the question at the base of my research project was what is the cultural and carbon significance of Irish peat bogs? And so here you can see a map of Ireland and you can see all of the colored places on that map are different types, different areas covered in peatlands. Um, in the center, there's kind of more reddish pink and those are the raised bogs. And on the west coast, you see a lot of green and blue and those are more of the blanket bogs. Um, so Ireland is covered in 20 or 20% of Ireland is covered in peat soil and peatlands. And um, that's a huge proportion. You know, if you think globally, only 3% of our land is peat soil, then having a country that's 20% means it's a really significant part of their landscape. So I thought it'd be really interesting to go and look at what does it mean to live amongst such a high um, frequency of peatlands and bogs? And um, what does that mean for people's culture and identity, but also, you know, how is cl the climate change conversation playing out there? Um, so this kind of aligns with uh, some of the perceptions that Maria was describing in her presentation before the break, but I thought I would give you just one quick quote from uh, a report from the Irish Environmental Protection Agency that was kind of trying to summarize the Irish uh, perception of peatlands. And so they said, peatlands and Irish people have been closely connected by a long history of cultural and economic development. In distant past, peatland landscapes were both feared and respected as wilderness areas and often linked to traditional culture, rituals, and worship. That's kind of more historically. And then in modern times, Peatlands have commonly been treated as wastelands and that are of no use unless they are drained or excavated. So this um, modern perception is more of what I encountered in Ireland and it's kind of more at the core of this question of how will peatlands be managed regarding climate change and the, cli the carbon emissions uh, from drained peatlands. And yeah, a lot of the modern perception of peatlands is in Ireland is really centered on this idea that they need to be changed to be useful. So drained or um, converted to agriculture or forestry. Um, there are some peatlands in Ireland that are in really good shape like this one. This is Clara Bog in the center of Ireland, uh, the largest raised bog in Western Europe that's intact. And um, it's protected by the National Park Service. 
And it's a really beautiful, uh, wet, healthy space. But more bogs in Ireland, unfortunately, look like this one. This is also uh, relatively close to that same place, Clara Bog, but it's not a protected bog. You can see that little island of peat soil in the center of the picture is uh, at the top of that little island is the former top or surface, I should say, of the bog that was there. But all the soil and the peat have been cut away, uh, in this case for use as fuel. And in order to do that cutting, then there had to be a lot of drainage to access the peat as well. So 85% um, of Irish peatlands are in some state of degradation. So there's a lot of drainage that has happened either for harvest for fuel or uh, agriculture or forestry or really big land use changes as well. Um, but when I say fuel, what I mean is, um, on the industrial scale, uh, peat soil has been burned in, in power plants to provide electricity, but on the home scale, it's still quite a common practice in Ireland to actually heat your home with dried peat soil. So when people are doing that, they, they're burning little bricks of, of peat that they've cut out, that they're called turf then. So you can see a turf fire on the right here. And on the left, there's this map showing the prevalence of heating homes with peat. And um, it's interesting, I guess not surprising, that the places that people are most likely to be heating their homes with turf um, also align with the geography of the bogs and the peatlands in Ireland. So on the whole, there are still 90,000 households that are heated with turf. And, you know, I think this is a pretty peatland savvy audience, but just in case it surprises you that you can burn a soil, well, it's really, you can think of peat as a super, super young form of coal. You know, it's almost entirely organic. It's not very compressed yet. And it's often still even relatively wet with when they're burning it, even though they've dried it. Um, so it's not necessarily an efficient form of fuel. It's definitely not a clean form of fuel. It releases a lot of, of particulates into the air and it's um, polluting type of, of fuel for heating your home, but it's still very common and it's something that's been done for hundreds of years in Ireland. And it's a, it's a quite an important part of people's culture. So what I wanted to share with you today, that's kind of the backdrop of, of the story I was pursuing, but my time in Ireland, I spent um, more in the journalistic capacity. So I went on and I interviewed a lot of people and recorded their stories and their, their ideas about peatlands, how they're connected to it. Um, some, in some cases, I asked them directly about the importance of Irish bogs for climate change. I also took a lot of photographs. Here's a man who's um, footing his turf or stacking it to dry it to take it home uh, to heat his house. And then I also recorded um, their voices. And so that's what I'm actually excited to share with you today. I want to play some of the voices and the stories of the people that I collected while I was in Ireland. So the first uh, story that I wanted to play for you is from Gary Brown, who's on the left in this um, photograph. And Gary uh, represents something that is really true and common about the Irish connection to peatlands, but it, it's not always spoken about in the context of peatland research, which is that many, many people in Ireland don't feel connected at all to peatlands. Um, Gary grew up in Dublin, and when he came out to, the, to Clara Bog with myself, and this is also my husband in this photograph on the right, um, Gary, uh, had never been to a bog before. He's in his late 30s. And so um, for him, you know, as an Irish person, if you said, what's your connection to peatlands? The answer would be, you know, nothing, no connection. So I wanted to play Gary's experience of a bog for the first time. And um, it allows you to see some of the interesting plants and things that he observed. But uh, here's what Gary saw when he came to a bog, yeah, for the first time. And I gave him a little glass jar 
And I asked him to put anything that he thought might be interesting uh, into the jar. And then as after we were done with our walk, uh, we talked about what he had found. Um, my name is Gary Brown and I am from Dublin. So I was given a lovely little glass. You can hear him. Okay, let me try this again. Last jar. Really just pop it in anything that's. Um, my name is Gary Brown and I am from Dublin. So I was given a lovely little glass jar. Really just pop it in anything that stood out. I have a little cranberry, which I will eat uh, on the way home. It's a little snack for the way home. Um, the cranberry. are very interesting in that they're literally dotted in the most random places I thought they'd be in in a bunch but you have to really go searching for them then I found a, an old snail shell really nice colors it's like a, a light pink it's all cracked and then I found a mixture of fungi and algae which is really interesting looks a bit like coral underwater um, and then my rosemary the rosemary is really interesting because you obviously see rosemary at home or when you get it in the shops, but this is like a completely different color, like a dark violet color and then a nice little flower at the top, pink flower at the top. What was that matchstick one as well? Matchstick lichen. Matchstick lichen, the, the red and the Matchbox matchstick lichen tiny. is so bright and very, very cool. Nice. So I'm sorry about the audio hiccup, but I think you could hear Gary's story in the end there. And... Um, you know, he found some beautiful plants. And the thing about bogs, peat bogs in Ireland and peatlands is that, you know, a lot of them maybe don't have a huge diversity of plants compared to some ecosystems, but the plants that thrive and need peatlands are very specialized to that environment. So many of the things that he found here could only be found in, in a peat bog. Um, so it was really nice to see him uh, exploring and finding some of the beauty of the bog for the first time. And the, the rest of the videos and audio that I'm going to show you um, are people who have much deeper connections to bogs and quite a range of different connections. And I also will warn you that they don't have subtitles. So that was kind of going easy on you a little bit with Gary. I think you could hear him and if you couldn't understand him then you had the subtitles and uh, the next ones don't and the accents kind of get progressively thicker so I hope you can stick with uh, the Irish accent. Uh, so the next person whose story I wanted to tell you has a very deep and close connection to that same bog that Gary was in and this is Professor Matt Saunders who is a scientist at Trinity College Dublin. He's a plant ecophysiologist and um, he is standing next to a very large and expensive instrument that he helped set up in the middle of Clara Bog. And it's a carbon flux tower. And so I went out with Professor Saunders and I asked him, you know, well, why are you out here doing all this hard work in this wet environment? And here's what he told me about why he thinks it's important to study peatlands. So peatlands are incredibly important in terms of keeping carbon in the soil and, and taking it out of the atmosphere, for example, um, in relation to how we're going to deal with climate change. So, yeah, pretty succinct that they can store a lot of carbon and that can have a huge implication for uh, adapting to and mitigating climate change. And, um, you know, I found quite a few scientists with a similar perception to Professor Saunders who were really concerned about you know, the ecological health of the peatlands and monitoring the drainage and the type of carbon emissions coming out of them. Um, and I learned a lot from them. And then I'm going to play you one more clip from him. And then we're also going to move to people who don't perceive uh, bogs as climate change and carbon assets in the same way. Uh, but here is Professor Saunders telling you a little bit of how he's using this carbon flux tower to monitor Clara Bog. We have 
um, a range of different you know kind of techniques and sensors that allow us to measure the bog breathing we can measure how much carbon is inhaled during the day through processes such as photosynthesis of plants and then we can measure how much carbon is exhaled at night through the respiration of both the plant material and of the soil substrate itself. Yeah, I loved that comparison. Of, uh, he's monitoring the bog breathing and can, and can sense the inhale and the exhale, he's almost like he's a doctor with a stethoscope held up to the bog. Um, and what you can see here on the right are solar panels that are powering the instruments that are kind of on the left there. And yeah, I won't go into detail. I couldn't do it any justice to explain all of the instruments there. But um, yeah, it's really, there's a lot of work going on in Ireland to assess and to try to protect the capability of the peatlands that are intact to continue to be carbon sinks for us. So a lot of that breathing of the bog is happening through the vegetation and through sphagnum moss. And um, when you look at people who are harvesting uh, peat out of Irish bogs, then you can think that they're kind of digging in and accessing uh, many, many years of sphagnum moss that has grown, died, captured uh, some carbon in its uh, plant structure, which has been submerged into the bog and has been kept there over time. And in Irish bogs, they say that they add about one millimeter of peat a year on average if they're healthy and growing. And so you can think that this piece of machinery that's cutting into the bog is actually accessing, let's say that's maybe two or three meter deep cut. Um, so that's two or 3,000 years of growth and death of sphagnum moss and the other plants uh, that have captured that carbon. And in the case of uh, this situation, it's being, it's being dug out to be burned as fuel. Um, so to think about, you know, on the flip side of Professor Saunders trying to monitor the health of intact bogs, many bogs, as I said, have been stripped and drained um, and they're no longer in a wetland state. And across Ireland, it's estimated that each hectare that has looks like the one you saw in the previous picture is actually emitting about 2.1 tons of carbon per year, which you could think of as the equivalent of a car driving about 30,000 kilometers. And on the whole, drained peatlands, including ones that are just drained for forestry and agriculture and aren't necessarily stripped, um, they release more carbon dioxide than the entire transportation sector in Ireland. So there's a lot of uh, potentials there if you can stop the emissions from peatlands in Ireland. Um, so, you know, thinking about that, and that's kind of the perspective I brought in for this research project, I really wanted to talk to people for whom that wasn't their perspective and to get to know, you know, if you make these proposals for climate change focused policies on how you manage peatlands, what does that mean to people on the ground? Um, so I went out to a lot of different bogs and I found people who do this every year, you know, it's part of their family, their memories, their history, that every spring they go out and they lay out the turf, they foot the turf, they burn it in their home for their fuel. And one couple that I spoke to, um, were the Laybourns, and Mary Laybourn is on the right here, and you can see they're sitting around their turf fire at home. You can see the basket of turf to the left of the fire, which is what they would fill uh, every day. They, they move the bricks from the basket into the fire, and they have a huge shed out back full of those bricks that gets refilled over and over. And so I sat with them next to their turf fire, and I said, I asked them to describe to me, you know, what does it mean to them, this, this way of living? And here's what Mary said. There's just something lovely. And even the smell of the turf burning and, you know, you walk in and it's just compared to like, you could burn, like say anything else, like timber has a different smell. The briquettes would have a different smell. There's just something about it. it's the real old style. It would bring you back to the old days you know, when you'd walk into a house even with an open fire and or the big open fires, you know, that just that real old smell. There's something magic about it. It's lovely. 
Yeah, so she really loves her turf fire. I mean, from what she said, it's kind of central to her feeling of home. At the end there, she even said there's something magic about it. So I'd say for Mary, it's pretty irreplaceable um, and important to her. So just starting to, you know, think about if that's the connection that someone has to turf and to using bogs for that purpose, um, climate change focused policies to change management have a pretty big um, emotional impact on somebody like Mary. Another man who loves uh, harvesting peat from bogs is Kevin Barry, who I went out to speak with. He's made his living as a machine driver, uh, so he's very skilled at driving heavy machinery across uh, really challenging wet terrain. And I wanted to talk to Kevin because he actually made an incredible archaeological discovery by accident. One day when he was digging out a drain, he just happened to scoop out what was then dated to be uh, the oldest. Uh, he scooped out a torso of a human body and the hand on that torso um, ended up providing the oldest set of fingerprints in the world. So you can see here that it was dated to maybe as old as 362 BC. And th this body that he scooped out is actually now on display in the um, National Museum of Ireland of Archaeology, National Museum of Archaeology in Ireland. And so you can go and see this. It, it shocked Kevin, of course, because he thought he was just doing some maintenance on a drain and he found a human body. He called the police and they actually had to mark it off as a crime scene and everything, but then finally realized how old of a body it was. At first, they didn't know. But um, yeah, Kevin spends a lot of his time in machinery like this. And so while I was out there interviewing him about his experience finding this body in the bog, I also got to talk to him about um, what this industry means to him, to his livelihood, to his community. And um, I'm going to play you a clip of what he told me. And I have to warn you that his accent is very thick, so I hope you can catch what he says. So here's what Kevin said to me about the peat industry. Like, the bog has kept us all going. A lot of people wouldn't be here at all. They'd be immigrated years ago. There'd be nothing to keep them. They'd have to go. So he said the bogs kept us all going. And without the bogs and this industry, people would have potentially had to immigrate and leave my community. And, you know, in Ireland, this is a very common narrative. When the economy is down, people not only have to maybe switch up careers or look for new jobs. They might have to leave the country altogether. You know, it's an island nation. There's only so much economic opportunity. So for him, uh, for people to say you need to stop harvesting peat, you, you know, this industry is uh, terrible for the climate and this kind of stuff, you know, he sees the death of his community in those words. He lives in a small rural town in the middle of Ireland, and the bogs are truly one of the only, we could say, local natural resources that they have going for their economy. And so this is his neighbor, Danny, 14-year-old, and he thinks that, you know, if, if peat harvest is shut down, that young people like Danny won't get to stick around the community and we'll have to move elsewhere. And, you know, clearly Danny's already cultivating the skills to be part of that industry. He knows how to drive machinery um, and he loved it out there. He looked up to Kevin. So that's another piece of loss that people might feel. So I'll end with one last story. And this is coming from the gentleman on the left. His name's Brian Sheridan. And Brian is an interesting mix of the two perspectives that I've been sharing with you, people that want to preserve the bogs and people that really want to use the bogs and drain them and use the peat as a resource. Um, and so I spent time with Brian, who they said is on the left, and his friend Tommy out on Clara Bog. And I'm going to play you a clip. It's a little longer clip. It's about two minutes. And Brian's going to tell you the journey that he's gone on in his own perception of Clara Bog and bogs in general. 
And one thing I want to point out before I hit play is that Brian's family has a very long and important history with Clara Bog. You know, Clara Bog is now this uh, wonderfully preserved place and an important ecosystem, even in the scope of Europe. Um, but Brian's grandfather was the trustee of Clara Bog um, in the time that Ireland gained its independence from the United Kingdom. And it was his grandfather's duty and honor to be kind of honest about it, to cut up Clara Bog and give out banks of turf. And that was a great position of leadership in his town. So you can see, you know, in Brian's family, they would have had a lot at stake with um, using Clara Bog as a resource. So here's what Brian told me about his relationship to Clara Bog. My name is Brian Sheridan. I'm from the town of Clara. And we're standing on the Clara Bog and we're on the west side. I nearly come to the bog every day. I have land up here in the hills of Berry and I go herding and in the morning when I finish herding, I generally take a trip down. Sometimes I walk and sometimes I, I don't. I just pull into the car park, get the fresh air and assess the number of people that's walking the bog. In my own mind, say, the bog was worth, well worth keeping when you see all the people walking. It's great to see it. Well, my grandfather was trustee at Clara Bog, himself and Father Bracken, who was the VP in Clara, parish priest that is in Clara at the time. He was responsible for the bog and giving out the banks to people if they wanted to cut turf. Why aren't people continuing to cut Clara Bog today? Because uh, in the 1970s and 80s, uh, the government and the people realised that there was all the bog in Ireland was being cut away, and this was the largest intact bog in the country, and they decided to preserve it. And then the EU came in and financed regeneration of it. And uh, at the time. There was an argument about people wanted to continue cutting turf and they wanted to pour the moan on it because of money and jobs and what have you. And it took them a while to realise that the bog was more of an asset left the way it is than cutting it away because once you cut it, it's gone. Do you think that was difficult for the community to make that change? Well, it was because people had you always cut turf. And you know yourself, when you always do something, someone tells you, you can't do it. The first reaction, why can I not do it? So there's an argument straight away, especially an Irishman. You can't tell them what to do. You can ask them, but don't tell them. <laughs> so it was, uh, yeah, really amazing to spend time with Brian and witness this change of perception that he has of Clara Bog. And he really is a huge advocate for it as a preserved ecosystem now. And even this was 2019 when I met him and spoke with him, but I noticed even as recently as last month, um, he was still speaking publicly and he made an address to a biodiversity conference about the importance of, of the bog for his community as, as an asset in the form of a healthy peatland. So really uh, nice. Yeah, so I'll just wrap up here. If you're interested in other stories that I put together from this fellowship, you can find a range of them on my website, or maybe you can uh, stay in touch via social media if you'd like. Um, but yeah, I'll stop there and maybe there are questions. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Emily, for this. Uh... Yeah, very interesting presentation. I uh, was almost getting carried away again with time. We'll certainly visit your uh, website. Before giving the floor to others, I just wanted to share something that, you know, I think stuck with me, that the health of the bug is of significant uh, implication in the face of climate change. Uh, thinking of their functions as carbon sinks, 
And it was nice to hear, you know, the last speaker that keeping the box intact, I mean, that the bug is more an asset to be left as it is. So I thought that was uh, really uh, encouraging to hear. Uh, I don't know if any one of us, there are no questions in the, does anyone? Yeah, Kate, I see your hand. Oh, oh hello. Okay. I put a question in the yeah. chat, Yeah, but I'll read it out. Oh, okay. thank you. I come from Great Britain and I have to recognise my country as a former coloniser of Ireland. So I wonder if the perception of bogs as a wasteland is connected to this history at all. It's classic that colonising powers talk about places as empty, while at the same time using the resources that it provides. I can imagine that this is difficult to talk about to this day, and I wasn't taught any Irish history at school. I feel ignorant. <laughs> And the question is, how much peat was extracted for export to the UK historically? Was mm. this something that people talked about at all? That's a good question, Kate. Um, one way that the connection to British uh, use of resources that came up. Emily, and I think it, no, no. Oh, no, you're not. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, and it's it is a common theme in colonization and the history of colonization is the mapping that was done of the colonized place. And the English uh, people who came in to use those resources did this incredible um, mapping survey of Ireland and provided some of the most accurate um, documentation of the scale and scope of peatlands and bogs around Ireland from the historic perspective in the 1800s, I think it was completed, I don't remember the year. Um, perhaps with the intention of draining and using those peatlands, um, I didn't hear a lot of talk about wide scale efforts of British people to drain and export peat. Um, that doesn't mean it didn't happen. The story you hear a lot is that post-independence, there was a real push from the Irish national government to become energy independent and use the bogs as a resource to help build their economy. And so, yeah, the story that I hear a lot is the industrialization of drainage and, and harvest post-colonization. Um, but yeah, that's an interesting question, if, if much of it was exported before or after uh, to, to the UK. I'm not sure about that. Oh, thanks very much, uh, Emily. Yeah. I see. Uh, <clears throat> does that answer your question, Kate? Can Kate thanks so much. And I no. noticed that Jamie has put a comment in the chat. Yeah, I noticed yeah. that too. Jamie, uh, a horticultural peat gate, huge exports to the UK from Ireland, even to this day. Yeah. No. Uh, I think because of uh, time, we yeah. could go on and on about this. Uh, I was just going to write to you, Emily, if you would like to share your, your link, uh, if you think that's uh, a good idea. Yeah, which link? Yeah. No, you mentioned your 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 site. If people okay, want yeah, more can... information about it, you could put it in the chat. Maybe? I'll put it in the chat. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. There are lots of uh, compliments. Uh, yeah, for the uh, presentation, the story, the good storytelling. Thanks very much. Uh, I think we now have Kate. Uh, we go to Kate's presentation. We're a few minutes uh, behind schedule, but we'll be fine. I think. Uh, uh, thanks, Emily, for that, to wrap up. Uh, we go to Kate's uh, now, uh, reimagining reimagining peatland figures. So even more artistic way of uh, uh, looking at this topic. <clears throat> so Kate, uh, the floor is over to you. Thank you very much. And thank you, Emily Toner, who's not only just given an amazing talk, she's also mm -hmm. set us up technically here and sorted out things like yeah. um, when we get stuck with slides. I'm Kate Foster, an environmental artist, and I'm committed to creating dialogue around valuing wetlands and their soils through my residency in the World Soil Museum. 
And I really want to start with my appreciation of our venue for the series, both the museum and the wider department, ISRIC, dedicated to world soil information. Many people, including artists, are attracted to the museum's fascinating collections. As well as being a scientific enterprise, the collections have an aesthetic appeal and can awaken quite spiritual responses that are quite hard to pin down. And as we discussed in the last session, poets can sometimes voice what we might want to say about entwined human and soil histories. Today's theme of living with peatlands is accompanied by an inquiry about perceptions of peatlands. Peatlands are patterned by cultures. Working as an artist means developing insight into this cultural legacy and making new representations, coming from somewhere within yourself. I'll talk a bit about my process of figuring things out as a visual artist. And my contribution to peatland exchanges has included new drawings in response to the research talks. I'm calling these drawings peatland figures and they're developing in a non-human form. You'll see from what I say that an artist's practice is not linear and that things are always work in progress because one idea leads to another. I'll give a recap of the figures and this is a kind of resume of the exchanges so far. Then I'll introduce this week's figures, a table, a cactus, and a plant in compost, and end with some reflections on reimagination. I'll tell you about some plans to take the residency forward with peat proceedings. And my slide has just got stuck. Here comes Emily to the rescue. <laughs> Great, thank you. From inside, working as an artist doesn't feel as programmatic as this, but it's a guide that helps work out a strategy and it helps me think about how to use the opportunity of this residency. It helps frame ideas of the interdisciplinary role that arts and humanities can play. And I thought it would be useful to put in at this point. What can arts do? Why arts? a distinct way of understanding the world and ourselves. They can provoke and settle norms, be political, illuminate problems, expose values and choices, educate, inspire and persuade, open up new perspectives through imagination, help us live with uncomfortable truths and help us adapt to new realities. I'm gonna tell you a bit about how the idea of developing figures as shadow puppets began. <clears throat> For me, it's part of the ongoing necessity of decolonizing myself, understanding how my thinking is shaped by my privilege. In 2016, I committed my artwork to support local peatland restoration in southwest Scotland. Al Palmwood, an Australian philosopher, argued that paying attention to a single place can deflect attention to other places that we are also bound to in other times and spaces. She talked about shadow places of our consumer selves. We live within extractivist economies. And as a consumer, I am offered an array of products containing palm oil from tropical peatlands, particularly in Southeast Asia. I began to make figures for that trade. I wanted to foreground plant, so I began with palm oil, palm oily herself. I moved on to represent fighter jets sold to UK's former colony Malaysia, an arms trade that I understood influences trade agreements. I drew a plastic wrapper of a picnic chocolate bar and referred to the logo of the current Malaysian oil palm board. I made a symbol for carbon dioxide. <clears throat> There's also an image of a Malay worker, directly taken from a photo in a colonial book from the early 20th century, where the imperial writer noticed a reluctance to work in plantations. After this, I began an experiment of using artifacts to symbolize human activities rather than create human characters. Emily Turner asked at the last session if these figures were going to develop into a performance. And I want to answer the question better now than I did then. People in the Netherlands seem often to have an affection associate association with shadow puppets. 
thinking of them as coming from Indonesia, the country's former colony. And I wanted to show a recent example of a post-traditional development of environmental storytelling in this tradition. This show was called Asli, Resonance in Our Roots and performed in Kuala Lumpur. These are the shadow puppeteers, musicians and artists who performed the tailor-made script. It's a wonderful example of celebrating indigenous stories and it was a fundraiser for groups whose sustainable patterns of life are compromised by plantation economies. Meantime, I'm someone trained in Scottish art schools, now here in the Netherlands. And this series of talks has helped consolidate the drawings with the working title Peatland Figures. And here's a moment to review and think, what next? I think visually and I'm most comfortable drawing. My mode is authorial illustration, really, not theatre. I'm drawn to shadow puppets as objects that I can make. Of course, I'd love to develop their scope through collaboration. Here's a recap of the ones that I've already shown in peatland exchanges. Naturally, I had to begin with the peat bog in response to the hydrological theme in Oki and Norta's talk, where we glimpsed the former extent of peat box in the Netherlands. Following Cindy Quick's presentation on scientific use of the peat archive, I thought of a new boggy symbol, an hourglass made of time indicators, a testate amoeba, a natural form, and a prehistoric pot as an artifact. Section two, we focused on a selection of archaeological objects found in peat bogs, visiting the archives of the Drents Museum with the curator Floor Houseman as a guide. Many shoes have been found in peat bogs. And I made a figure of a red shoe, which merges ideas of sacrifice and accidental loss. A figure for Roy van Beek's environmental archaeology had to be something about the space between found objects how to represent negative space. Here's a drawing of the depression of an oak wood chip from one of the Netherlands' greatest archaeological finds, the Barga Ofteveld Temple. <coughs> Maurice Pallison's painstaking cultural historical research uses old maps. We exchanged some favorites, both of which showed peat bogs at the cusp of commodification. Cartography played a role as they began to be exploited for their peat, just like Emily was talking about. One of the earliest fossil fuels. I was fascinated to see that map symbols were developing in form at the same time. So I began to release the classic rush that we now use for, to map wet ground. First I made a version for summer and then one for winter that can perhaps also stand for night. I read in Maurice's paper that one use of peat in the town that I'll just shorten to call Den Bosch in the Dutch Golden Age was to make beer. He's a tankard adapted from a still life painting. One of Abby Flint's research methods was to analyse responses from TripAdvisor. As tourists, we're encouraged to become consumers and TripAdvisor plays a part in this. So I wanted to make a wise advisor, and it took an L form after the Greek, Athena. And here the metaphor of shadows comes back. Shadows can be used to suggest things, like the flow of rippling water, or to disguise things. We can use colourful images to distract ourselves from Val Plumwood's shadowlands of consumerism. So now, the drawings I want to talk about in this session. I showed you this drawing from the last time of polders, characteristic reclaimed field shapes, and how they began to appear in maps in the long era of Dutch peat exploitation. I don't understand these field si systems intuitively, and I have to learn about them. It seems that land reclamation created an ongoing need to pump water from the new land. The drainage need to, needed to do this impacts the water table, as it's called in English. What is a water table? At a certain point underground, water, the soil or rock begins to be saturated with water. One thing I already knew about peatland restoration is that high, high ground water level underpins all the other processes in the healthy peat bog. 
My mind's been trying to visualize the process of maintaining different levels of grandeur. I stare at drains and shooters in front. This video gives me a feel of my disorientation. It came from a newly built suit at Ford and Bergstein, a peatland restoration site in the Yachtabus. I understood that the level of water below under the ground surface is too position. The water level seems to be usually too low. Extraction in one place leads to desiccation in another. And it's important for climate action that dried out peatlands means the release of carbon dioxide. I think about this through drawing. How can I represent it? I ran with the water table idea to conceptualize it as a wonky, crooked table that needs to be leveled up. The design of the table legs comes from the measuring posts that you see across the Dutch landscape. They tell you the height in relation to the sea level, and sometimes you see the water creep up the measure. In Dutch, a water table is water pile, another metaphor that I'm told can mean arrow or just measure. And in Dutch, the water surface is called water spiegel or mirror. Sound can work subliminally to shape our perceptions. A sound artist friend, Pantea, foregrounds found sound in the landscape in her compositions. We talked together and she made a sound sketch of the water table. She asked, what might the water table be saying? What might it sound like? Let's listen to it for a short section of this, a few seconds. I think it would be fantastic to work with Pantheon to animate the Pantheon figures with the soundtrack. It could, could become a way to play out the relationships between people and the landscape, connecting different times and places. These photos come from a studio exhibition in 2020. You can see Emily and Stefan Mantel illuminating the water table. At this point, I thought of the Pantheon figures as non human stakeholders. Since then, I've realized that stakeholders isn't necessarily a helpful metaphor. What are we saying when we say we have a stake in something? The idea comes from putting a stake in, a bet or a wager about the outcome of a horse race. Calculating chance can lead to financial gain or loss. Isn't it better to use the idea interested parties? And doesn't the concept of climate justice mean that the interested parties include younger and unborn generations, as well as people elsewhere impacted by rich people's consumption. So what image can I offer Emily in her role as community manager in Israel? I finally realized that the water table needs to be round, symbolizing a humanitarian approach to decision-making. This is a table that I yet have to build. But with this thought, the peatland figures I have made began to jostle for position. I think they each have a preference where they want to be in relation to the surface between air and soil. In my mind, the hourglass slunk contentedly underground. The tanker displayed itself on a complimentary blue table. The wise advisor could just look on. The shoe kept sinking down due to the sucking proclivity of the bog. Each peatland figure needs to find a level in relation to the water table. And now I want to animate this image. For Maria, Maria de Witt, who gave the first paper, I want to add one more peatland figure to the table. Why should it be a cactus? Maria is taking care of this cactus, which lives in a room in the cultural geography department in this building, the Gaia building of Wageningen University. I used this room too, briefly, before lockdown, and I began to water and study this plant. It's pre-loved. It's taken a place in my imagination. Perhaps it can offer new stories and meanings. Becoming interested in cacti, I began to look around and see others in my neighborhood. This one had been planted up in an old dog food tin. 
It sat outside on a neighbor's garden table. This one I received as a gift and I left it on my windowsill in Scotland. I think it's a he. I heard that since I left, he has grown and grown. My friend sent a photo. Then I began to ask myself how many of the cacti I saw around me have been potted up in peat-based compost. Wetland soils really don't suit desert plants like cacti. But when you go shopping for plant compost, peat is everywhere. Using it for arid plants is a desiccation, and I think a desecration of its preferred state. For Maria de Witt's work on living with peatlands today and her care for plants, here is a cactus. This figure might stand for other crops grown on reclaimed peatland. Perhaps I, later I can make more figures. Maize, wheat, grass, pigs. I need to think too about the cultural perceptions that grow around these crops. Each week I've been in each session, I've been showing a drawing on a compass bag with a reminder of the destructiveness of the trade in peat. This session, I return to the plant in Gaia for the uncomfortable query of the origin of its soil. In other talks, I've mentioned the joy of a project studio in the World Soil Museum. There are two sections. So the studio side where I'm showing the puppets and room for inspiration with other people's work and ideas. It'll be up until April the 6th and I've written about it in a blog post. I go to the museum when it's open on Wednesday afternoons whenever possible. All are welcome to visit. And over the past two weeks, I've been thinking how to keep reimagining peatland figures during my residency. When you write a proposal, you have to rehearse the basics. Think back to the slide I showed about what art and humanities might offer. Why do I find it important to reimagine relationships to peatlands? What does this entail? I'm going to mention two helpful references. Talking about community involvement in restoring peatlands in Ireland, Kate Flood and her colleagues identified the process of remembering, reimagining, and restoring. To look at reimagining more closely, what does that entail? For Kate Flood and colleagues, recognize the values of love care and meaningfulness. Create new cultural practices and traditions as legacies for the next generation. Provide space for scientific, traditional and local ecological knowledge in conservation practice. Another instance on me is Repeat, a youth-led collective pushing for a peatland paradigm shift. They have a creative approach to advocacy, which I support. Their manifesto demands collaboration, education, and reimagining. This is conceptualized as a place where both our inner and our outer landscapes might involve. Their statement recognizes a future with pain and grief, but the work these young people want to do is to leave space for the steps of curiosity and coexistence. Yes, I see that pain and grief lie ahead, and I think artists should help adapt to new realities. One place for this to happen is at the upcoming World Soil Congress, themed Crossing Boundaries and Changing Society. There's an arts programme called Our Living Soil. I plan to take my sketchbook to this congress via Amstel Park in Amsterdam beforehand, and to work with Carrie Morrison, an artist who is now project officer for a community aspect of a peatland restoration project in Galloway called Peatland Connections. Mostly people don't seem to think about peatscapes in their everyday life, and mostly that we don't follow that land abuse or abuse decisions very closely. Disciplinary specialisation can mean that the body of a peat bog can be disintegrated into different kinds of expertise. Crossing disciplinary boundaries means finding shared values and thinking of peatlands as part of landscape and society. Restoration rationale is based on scientific insight, but engaging communities means engaging wonder and curiosity about a specific soil that is only alive when it is wet and creates its own peculiar ecology. In the Congress, I'll work closely with Kerry 
Carrie Morrison, so I want to introduce her now. She uses her sense of urgency about the nature crisis to find new ways of working as an artist. She invites participation. Here she is sewing bags to help walkers on the hillside get physically involved with peatland restoration. She makes a, it as a convivial process, improvising ways to cross boundaries. Peat proceedings will point to collaborative courses of action, slow work in urgent times. Through my residency in the World Soil Museum, I plan to reconvene in the autumn to share the learning from this over a round table, of course. On the way, I'll be drawing and presenting other workshops, developing some of the themes that have come up in the exchanges. So thank you all, and please keep in touch with any comments, ideas for inspirations or corrections. Just get in touch or follow social media to find out more about the upcoming work. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Kate, for this uh, uh, presentation and for all the insights uh, provided. Food for thought. Uh, I think in the comments before I go, we see, uh, oh no, Emily has put your a link to your blog in the comment. And um, comment, Kate, you have such a wide and inclusive perception of pitlands. If someone wanted to approach pitlands as a topic to inspire their art, what advice would you give them? I guess it depends if you've got a peatland that you can go to and look at nearby safely. If you have, go and look at it and look at the surface and try and draw what you see. It takes a long time to get your eye in and to make sure that you've got something waterproof to sit on. But listen or just go and look at what's there. I think it's very interesting to think about remote connections to peatland. And this was something that I tried to do in lockdown. Mm. I think then it becomes a lot of fun to think about how peatlands present themselves in your everyday life, like the place names or the cultural histories which have created the objects by using peat. So many different ways that you can map out and in appreciate the significance of peat in your lives and just in case that you think you live in an arid country I believe that even the continent in the picture behind us Africa has significant areas of peatland so it's always interesting to work out where your nearest peatland is. Thanks very much for that Kate. I was also about to ask do you look out for you know this wherever you go to and how much of your time do you spend, you know, like you said, just go out and observe doing that? It's slightly painful because not nearly enough, I feel. Yeah. Um, but then I've had the luxury of spending a lot of time in peatlands in my life before now. Um, and I have to acknowledge that I put them into the background. I saw them as the places between the hills but now I've begun to foreground them and see them as really interesting in their own right. I, uh, between 2016 and 2019, I was able to spend a fair amount of time going there and seeing it through the eyes, ID, eyes of people with different scientific expertise. And now I have to work out how my perceptions have become bound up with the science. Thanks so much, uh, Kate. Uh, does anyone else uh, have a question? We don't have a question yeah. for you in the... Uh, yeah? Could I have a small question? Yes, please. So now you've, you've been here with us for a few years, Kate, and uh, um, you were also very cautious and um, about that you have to learn still a lot and, and um, you're very modest in that sense. But now maybe it's, uh, you're in the stage that you could maybe reflect a little bit on, um, on Dutch books and how people look at them do you, do you think there's a there's a dutch way of looking at books or is it a universal thing and how do you think we are dealing with our books in general does it differ from your experiences in the uk i think there's something very similar with uk in the in uk the finlands um in uh, southeast in east anglia are really significant to uh, carbon and carbon trade and I think the same things go on in Netherlands 
um, to do with a lot of farming, and I don't really know anything about that. Um, in terms of differences or reflections, when I talked about the water table, that's totally genuine. I'm absolutely confused by how water flows in this country. Um, but I do begin to see that there's an enormous amount of effort that has been put into the landscape. But the landscape I began by thinking was a classic, iconic Dutch landscape is intimately connected with the creation of polders, with reclaiming and with the draining. Um, and on one hand, coming from peatland restoration, I'm like, oh, <laughs> oh, how worrying. And it, it is an extraordinary feat. And as I spend more time here, I begin to see, hmm, but wouldn't you be just a little proud of that if you had had a part in making it? <laughs> So I can really see the, the ambivalence in thinking about peatland, which comes from living in a reclaimed country in a little more nuance than I could when I arrived. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think we can just uh, flow into the discussion session. I just said to Roy if he would like to join you. Thanks very well, much, uh, Kate. I can join, but I didn't answers. really speak so. But okay, I... yeah. If you prefer, would you rather stay here? Uh, I'm fine That's here. Fine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think to keep to time, we could just uh, go into it. So uh, from uh, our participants, if you have questions for any of the speakers, including Kate, could you uh, you can go ahead and ask the questions to them. <clears throat> I think, uh, yeah, I'm out of questions too, because I think I understood quite clearly. It will probably come back ruminating over what uh, has been learned uh, today. But yeah, I live in, uh, yeah, on Pitland. Yeah, that has been uh, adopt, I mean, how do you say, uh, modified in several ways, but also close by, we have such areas. I think a take home for me now is I'll become even more aware of that as I go. So uh, all the work that's been done so far, including the storytelling, the artistic representation, and also the more uh, uh, scientific, uh, uh, how do you say, uh, search into this as presented by all of you. <clears throat> I think has uh, yeah a lot of added value to the awareness of uh, peatland for me and I hope for our listeners uh, participants too. Uh, if you have yeah more ideas uh, about this, how we can cash in on this, please go ahead. Or. <clears throat> Otherwise, we could also conclude if you're happy mm -hmm. with that. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. maybe I can just um, at least conclude by um, um, <coughs> thanking everyone who has contributed to this whole series because I think they went really quickly. We're already in series number four now and it has flown by, I feel. <coughs> and I would really like to thank the World Soil Museum and especially Emily for all the support and also the content. The great talk today. Uh, also, Stephen Montel, who unfortunately <coughs> is not here today, but he gave really nice presentations or introductions to the first three sessions. And he was also, was also really vital in helping us on our way and thinking through the structure and also making the exhibition that Kate was working on um, and still will develop. And obviously, Kate, for being here and uh, for inspiring all of us, of, I think, um, and all the other speakers, including Maria, of course, today and uh, Mary for hosting us today. So I must say, I hugely appreciated it and um, I learned a lot. Yes. Thanks very um, much, uh, Roy. I'd like to <laughs> yeah, Emily. that because having listened to all the speakers in <clears throat> one, two, three, and now four, it's such a rich diversity of approaches to studying and understanding peatlands. And yeah, I think it's in part a reflection of 
the very diverse and interdisciplinary interests of the people who organized it. And I think Kate and Roy were kind of at the heart of putting the, the mm. program together. And it just, yeah, I felt it was such a rich program across all the series. And um, it's just a beautiful thing to see such intellectual curiosity expressed in a whole series of programs. So thank you, Kate and Roy, for bringing all of this to us. It was really enjoyable. Thanks to uh, Emily's work on YouTube. All of the sessions will be are already available apart from this session. Yeah. And we will make sure to bring that to people's attention um, as a package. So thank you, Emily, for yeah. that there. And Maria, for also for your technical work on the series in the way. Yeah, Maria did quite a bit of video yeah. editing along yeah. the way. And other stuff we Yeah. yeah. Um, so nice. No. It's going to turn into a war of thanking. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah, I agree. laughs> yeah. So maybe we could end by thanking Mary for stepping in and hosting the last yeah. session and sharing your own. You're welcome. Yeah. Thank you, Mary. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think uh, <clears throat> I thank you all. Uh, it's been a, a very fruitful afternoon, I think, to all of us. Uh, <clears throat> Before closing, I'll just, I had to do this for, uh, from stay, uh, for stay friend to, you know, inform all our participants or those who may be watching later, hopefully soon, that the exhibition of uh, Kate's work is still on. So you're invited to visit the museum. And if you're on time, maybe also you get the opportunity to interact with uh, Kate, you know, on this interesting uh, topic and her her work. So you are uh, welcome to visit uh, <clears throat> the Walsall Museum at Gaia in uh, Wageningen. Thanks so much. And uh, on behalf of uh, Stefan and all of us at uh, Isric, I'd like to say, Kate, I hope you enjoy your, you know, your coming days here. And thanks yeah, to yeah. everyone. Thanks, uh, Emily, Maria and Roy too. Yeah. Right. Okay. Nice. Right. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Bye everyone. Yeah.